I want to talk about something that you're kind of wondering, like, why are we talking about sort of a weird subject? And it is kind of. Uh, but I think it's something that can raise awareness and something that, you know, when we think about businesses, we think about profit, and we think about this concept that I talk about in my book called addiction for profit, something that America is very, very good at. But I want to introduce you to someone first. I want to introduce you to a guy named Dave Gerlitz. Uh, David Gerlitz was the face of Winston cigarettes for uh, almost two decades. He was the Winston man. Uh, he was the model for cigarettes. And in one instance really uh, encapsulates, and this is, of course, tobacco, encapsulates what happened. He was um, actually doing a photo shoot on stage, similar to this, with beautiful background. Instead of these plants and you know, the, the logos here, that he was surrounded by cigarette boxes because it was a photo shoot. And they were real cigarette boxes. They were cartons filled with, with dozens and dozens of boxes of cigarettes. And there were all the uh, tobacco executives there watching the photo shoot. And uh, he said to them, do you mind if I take one of these cartons? Because oh, there were like 50 cartons. And they said, hey, you can take them all. And he said, wow, what, you don't smoke? And they said, no, of course we don't. Uh, he, and then they said to him, and he said this under oath in Congress 23 years later, he said, uh, the, the tobacco executive said, we don't smoke. We reserve that right for the young, the poor, the black, and the stupid. And when you think about our history with... Um, all kinds of drugs, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, and of course, the other drugs like fentanyl, which has totally changed the game when it comes to substance use in this country, we don't have a great track record here. Uh, a historian once called it the American disease uh, addiction. Uh, we don't have a tr good track record when it comes to addictive substances. These are chemicals that act on you neurotransmitters know, in your brain and all over your body. And when you tie that in with capitalism, with uh, profit, it's not usually a great result. And to this day, we have almost half a million people dead a year from tobacco-related illness. Most of those people started smoking decades ago. Alcohol still is tied to incarceration, violence, arrests, and death more than almost all illegal drugs. Fentanyl is giving it a bit of a run for its money, but still, it kills more people. And our track record is not good. You know, tobacco, go back to tobacco, has a long history, in human history, it's been used for thousands of years. It only became deadly about 150 years ago when the Industrial Revolution started. You know, Amer again, count on good old American innovation to take something and make it deadly. Tobacco was essentially a mild irritant. It was used for many cultures, thousands of years. But when we were able to industrialize it and put, you know, add some other substances in it that were carcinogenic and also addictive and put it in this little stick called a cigarette, we created the biggest weapon of mass destruction we have in human history. And we unleashed the power of advertising, the power of Madison Avenue. So when you combine Madison Avenue and, then in, and, and, and industry and, and in the southern U.S., you really had a recipe for disaster. And, you know, the, the tobacco industry followed a specific playbook. Uh, first of all, they called their product medicine, which is kind of funny, but uh, they had asthma cigarettes, if you think, believe that, that's a real thing. Um, you know, it was, it was advertised by celebrities, uh, any, every celebrity, from Jackie Robinson to Ronald Reagan to Cary Grant. I mean, everyone you love, I hate to break it to you, they were selling cigarettes. They were able to, you know, utilize childlike messaging, Flintstone smoked, believe it or not. They made it fun and cool. Uh, the free giveaways, obviously sex sells, so they combined it with that, and then specifically targeting people of color, especially with menthol cigarettes and, and, and other issues. Uh, that was also a specific thing because, folks, addiction is not only biology. It's half biology, half environment. And when your environment, when you're not given opportunities, when you're less likely to have access to healthcare, housing, education, employment, you are more likely to slide into addiction. That is a risk factor. And these industries, to them, addiction is money, addiction is profit. So, of course, they would target people of color. And, you know, what a lot of people don't realize, what's, what's, what's interesting now, of course, is we've sort of learned our lesson a little bit. Smoking is at historic lows. You know, we don't have smoking in airplanes anymore, believe it or not. Uh, anyone under 30 does not know what a smoking section in a restaurant even is. They've never experienced that. That's a remarkable thing. In fact, the reduction in smoking is one of the biggest public health gains in human history in terms of what we've been able to do to push down smoking. But it took a lot of really bad experience to get us there. Um, it still kills almost half a million people a year. It's killed hundreds of millions of people around the world. And it's made this industry one of the most profitable industries, more profitable than McDonald's, Coke, and Starbucks combined, the, tobacco, the global tobacco industry today even. 
And that's what smoking levels at historic lows in the United States. Of course, they're growing in other sectors of the world. But I'm here to actually talk about there's, some, there's a new guy in town. There, there's a new substance that's now being used, taking sort of its cultural background to confuse Americans uh, into thinking this is your Woodstock weed, this is 4%, this is no big deal. Um, you know, you just use it to relax, how different it is than, mar- than uh, alcohol even. And, you know, turning it into a substance that we've never seen before, turning it into... THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana, levels, you know, almost 100% THC levels, 99.9% in some of these waxes. And it's an issue we're sort of not talking about. We don't know how to talk about. Baby boomers really don't know how to talk about it because they used it in the 60s and 70s, didn't use it in the 80s and 90s, and are rediscovering it now that their kids have gone to school. It's sort of no big deal. You know, CBD gummies help me, you know, put me to sleep. What's the difference? There's so much misinformation about what's out there and what the differences are. And that's a very purposeful thing by this industry that is exactly copying the tobacco industry of the past. And it's doing it right under our nose, in fact, while, while we roll out the red carpet for it. Uh, we're openly embracing it. We are pretending that it's an answer to economic woes. I mean, marijuana is the only product I've ever heard of that can cure cancer, get rid of Mexican drug cartels, and uh, achieve social justice in this country. Uh, but that's what it's being sold as. And to be honest, it's guys that look like me who have never, you know, often they don't care about social justice, never cared about social justice in their life, who are now putting on civil rights buttons with marijuana leaves. Uh, and you have to really ask what the intentions are there. Because you now have an industry, first of all, 25 years ago, right in this state, calling something medicine that had absolutely zero medical research behind it other than the components of the plant. The marijuana plant's a complex one. It has many components. There are some medicinal components, don't get me wrong. But it was confusing that purposefully with saying anything related to marijuana is medicine. And it was putting a breast cancer survivor on TV with $5 million ad buy to say, this helped me. Wouldn't you, won't you vote for it? And most people would, because why wouldn't you? We're compassionate people. So, you know, sort of loosen the permission structure by claiming it's medicine, just like big tobacco. The celebrity endorsement that I don't have to tell you, um, you know, when you have, you know, Snoop and Seth Rogen and Martha Stewart endorsing the same thing, you know that it's gone multiple different demographics. Um, It's pretty deep. Um, uh, You know, utilizing childlike messaging, uh, making it fun and cool. The influence of the sports industry is tremendous, by the way. The giveaways, um, sex selling, of course, and once again, targeting people of color and doing so in a way that is sort of appealing to humanity by saying we had a devastating war on drugs, which I agree with, we did, uh, for decades. And so therefore, we're going to give people of color a chance to get in early on this business uh, and, and selling it that way. Um, the reality is what it's doing to poor communities of color is devastating. When you look at where the pot shops are in this country, even in the state, for example, they are concentrated in poorer communities of color. They're where the liquor stores are. They're where, you know, you can get lottery, the scratch cards. They're where the food deserts are. Uh, And that is very purposeful because you have a lot of upper-class white communities who vote for this. But then when they're presented, do you want it in your own Neighborhood? Do you want it where your son goes to school? Oh no, no, no! Put it over there, please. We don't. I mean, no one's ever told a realtor, you know what? I want to buy a brand new, beautiful house, great investment. Can you please find it near a pot shop? Right? That just doesn't happen. And so, right now, we're seeing this over and over. And the irony is, this is being sold as social justice. Well, what's happened in Colorado since, for example, they were the first state to do it? Arrests for young people of color have gone up, not down. Well, why would that be? Well, because using it in public is still illegal. Driving and using it is illegal. And so if you're talking about a system that you're trying to upend and you're thinking you're going to be able to do that by targeting one small thing, uh, you're not. Because there will always be reasons to round up young black people if you want to. And so the idea that, you know, just, okay, cross marijuana off, there's 20 other reasons. But even with marijuana, there's still reasons to arrest people. When you look at who's more likely to still be arrested 10 years after legalization, the disparities have gotten wider, not slimmer. And when you look at these businesses, that's the saddest thing I've seen, you know, young black men in Newark, from Newark, New Jersey to South Central LA line up for these, you know, seminars on how you can make it rich. Folks, if you're not one of the three or four companies that started into this 20 years ago, 
with capital and who you knew and the money and the investment, you're not going to be making it rich with this product that is so easy to grow. It's like bottled water. You're, we buy bottled water, water you get for free, but we still buy bottled water. It's a similar thing. That's how cheap and easy it is. It takes people that can do this to scale. And so these states are saying we're going to do this for equity and pretending that they're doing it for that reason, and not one state has been able to do that. When you look at who actually is benefiting from this, it is not people um, from poorer communities of color that are all of a sudden becoming millionaires from this. But that's the promise. Now, you might be thinking, well, who cares? It's marijuana. We're not talking about fentanyl. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because today's marijuana isn't the marijuana of the past, and that means it's producing some outcomes that are really ugly. And there's, there are, these are ugly truths that, you know, as a country that went through Woodstock and certainly has PTSD, rightfully so, from a war on drugs, it's hard for us to try and think about it. But when you look at the science, um, it is pretty shocking and devastating when you see that, you know, peer-reviewed research is showing that a third of people who use marijuana in the last year are actually addicted to it. They're using it almost every day because of the product we're talking about. And we talk about kids, well, the adolescent brain is very susceptible to anything, good and bad, whatever, but it's very susceptible to THC binding in those early, in the receptors that are located throughout critical parts of brain growth. A lot of people don't think marijuana is addictive. Most people don't. I had someone in the audience the other day, 16-year-old kid, he raised his hand. He said, Kevin, uh, I know marijuana, you're full of it. Marijuana is not addictive. I know it's not addictive. And I said, well, how do you know that? You know, what, did you see a study I didn't see? How do you know that? And he said, I know marijuana is not addictive because I happen to use it every single day. So I can... <laughs> I can speak from experience. Um, he said that with a straight face. <laughs> that, that, that is the reality. If we weren't laughing, we'd be crying. Uh, when you look at the percent of people who have said that they used a substance in the last month, how many of those people use it every day? When you look at alcohol, for the last 50 years, 10% of drinkers drink every day. That's just been steady. When you look at marijuana in the last 20 years, we're now up to 50%, half of people who used it once a month actually used it every single day. So we're talking about a product that's so much more addictive now that when you look at leading researchers from the UK and other places around the world, they are now saying this is the singular most important link to the youth mental health and mental illness epidemic we have in this country. But we don't hear about that at all. People don't know how to talk about it. They're afraid of being uncool. They're afraid of being racist, let's just be honest. They're afraid of being on the wrong side of history because some governor that they like happened to embrace marijuana, so they can't say anything. Can't tell you how many legislators, how many A-list celebrities text and email, you know, I, I, I can't really come out about this publicly, but I need some help. My kid, A, B, and C, could please send me resources. It's happening all, all over, but it's something that we don't want to talk about. It's increasing your risk for psychosis and schizophrenia fivefold. There's no other drug that does that. And when you look at suicide, when you look at depression, anxiety, we're seeing the link. Interestingly, it's something that I can't think of one thing that the Trump, Biden, and Obama administrations actually agree on that when pressed publicly, because this isn't something any politician really wants to talk about, but when pressed publicly in Congress or whatever, they have had to say, actually, we are very concerned about this. This is President Biden's Surgeon General, who was the Surgeon General also under President Trump. And, but this isn't getting out there. Um, you know, PR is not exactly the uh, forte of PhDs. Um, that's a problem. The, the science says something so clearly, but culture and celebrity and everything else, and when there's so much money involved, you now have big tobacco making billions and billions of investments in this. Um, our next goal at our organization, SAM, is to look at investment portfolios and urge people to divest from marijuana portfolios because they're becoming so prolific, even though it's an illegal drug still, federally. You have the former CEO of the company responsible for the overdose epidemic in this country. Purdue Pharma, remember them? They produced that little thing called OxyContin. It did a little bit of damage. You might have heard. That guy is now selling medical. He's moved on. He's selling medical marijuana. Like, it, you know, it's not exactly the bedfellows that you, know, that you want to have when you're thinking about public health, public safety, and, you know, responsible business. And just sort of to end here, I think we conflate issues a lot. We conflate decriminalization, which is about criminalizing people for using, with legalization, glamorization, normalization. 
and with even legitimate medical utilization. But these things are conflated by this industry on purpose to confuse things because most people are not wanting to legalize so they can go use weed. If you want to use weed, you can do it, legal or not, whatever. They're voting for it, most people, intelligent people, because they don't like the social aspects of a war on drugs and criminalization, which I don't either, by the way. So let's separate these issues. But we haven't been able to have that nuanced conversation to be able to do that. Nuance is not, you know, I was once told, I won't tell you which administration, at the White House that if it doesn't fit on a bumper sticker, you can't pitch it. And this is not barely fitting on a slide, let alone <laughs> in really small font, by the way, sorry, uh, let alone a bumper sticker. And I can do that now that I love government. That's one of the good things you can do. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from the economy. You know, we talk about an experiment. This is just an experiment. Now, by the way, Dr. Frankenstein had experiments too, and they weren't necessarily things we'd want to repeat. But we talk about this as an experiment. Well, the economists put it best. They said, while lab animals are an expensive way of understanding the risks of cannabis use, North Americans come free. And that's what we are. We are really seeing how this is affecting this generation. And now when you see the suicide, you know, I sort of wasn't meaning to bring this up, but when you look at what just happened in Maine, when you look at the gun violence in this issue, which has a lot of reasons why, I'm not saying it's one reason, but I challenge you to look at the singular common denominator substance among over 85% of the mass shootings in the last 10 years. You do your own research. That's what I tell when I talk to young people especially. Don't take my word for it. Don't take, no offense, Reddit, some subreddit threads, work for, word for it. You, you look at the peer-reviewed research, you look at the facts yourself, and you see what some of these things are putting together, and then you see, you think about why are we just walking so blindly into this without any questioning? I mean, that's what we're doing. We're not even questioning it. And yet, we're still recovering from that industry that killed millions and millions of people of big tobacco. So we're often set up with this false dichotomy, legalization or incarceration. And obviously, in your work, I mean, I just think we think about false dichotomies a lot. Um, how can we overcome them? This is just the classic view of what I think is we're walking into some mistake that in 50 years, we're going to look back, I think, and regret the whole thing. But it's because we fell into this dichotomy. Just like now, we regret ever having smoking sections in restaurants. I mean, any kid, you know, you tell there was actually a smoking section in a, in a, on an airplane 30,000 feet in the air, and we somehow thought that if we divided rows 1 through 12 <laughs> with 13 through 30, there would be some kind of protection, that, right? I mean, we laugh at it, and they're like, what were my parents and everyone else thinking? I think we're going to be going over that again. Um, I hope it isn't too late because when you look at our substance use epidemic in this country, which is driven by multiple drugs, it's the uh, factor related to 70 other illnesses. It's the number one public health issue in this country. And yet politicians will not talk about it. How many times have you heard? Either side wanting to even talk about it. Once in a while, fentanyl comes up these days because it's a game changer. But these things are all related. And they're often symptoms of also wider issues that we're not even wanting to talk about. This is just, we dove deep into one little niche here. But I, I challenge you to think about it, to have conversations, um, especially with you know, loved ones about this. Have them do their own research into what's happening. Uh, and they might learn something. And I, I hope you, you all just did maybe learn something just now too. Oh, think of sharing what you know.